better. And um, I was very, very impressed, not only with his credentials, but also as him as a human being, a very, very fine man. Mr. Perino has been Chief Executive Officer of the National Court Appointed Special Advocate, CASA for short, association since June of 1994. The National CASA Association, national organiza organization, is a national group for over 900 local CASA programs comprising some 53,000 volunteers. Local CASA programs recruit volunteers to provide advocacy for abuse, abused and neglected children. In short, CASAs are the child's voice in court. Mr. Perino holds law degrees from Cornell Law School and St. Catherine's College of Oxford University. While practicing law, he represented children as a guardian ad litem. While a practicing attorney, he decided early on to devote his time and talents to pro bono, meaning free, work on behalf of children. Mr. Perino's service to children in need has been international in scope as well. He has served as a consultant to international social service and child advocacy organizations in Europe on foster care policy and practice as well as Southeast Asia on a project designed to remove children from the exploitive sex industry. He has also worked as a juvenile probation officer and was an associate research scientist for the National Center for Children in Poverty at Columbia University. Immediately before joining CASA, he served as executive director of the Westchester Children's Association, one of the nation's oldest child advocacy organizations, and chaired a New York State multi-organization campaign for kids to increase funding for children's services. Among Mr. Perino's professional achievements are the authoring or co-authoring of several publications, including Discrimination in, Discrimination in Employment, a Guide for Children's Advocates, and the Children's Data Book. He has been a frequent speaker and presenter at domestic and international symposia on children, including the United Nations non-governmental organization Experts Meeting on Adoption and Foster Care the Rockefeller Archives Institute Symposium on Children at Risk, and the Amnesty International Forum on Children. As a result of his service to children, Mr. Perino received the New York Decade of the Child Award in 1992, and the National Association of Social Workers Westchester Citizen of the Year Award in 1994. And just last year, he was given the President's Award of the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges. On a more personal note, Mr. Perino and his wife, Karen, are the proud parents of two sons, Andrew, age 17, and Ethan, age 15. The title of Mr. Perino's talk today is The Impact of CASA, Past, Present, and Future, National Developments Affecting Children. Please join me in giving Mr. Michael Perino a warm welcome to Ball State University and University 2000. I hope you all can hear the rain and the, the thunder out there. Just in case anybody was thinking of leaving, you might want to stay here for a little while anyway. <laughs> and there's a nice bed up here. If anybody gets tired, just come on up and take a, have a nice lie down. Let me tell you what I'm really going to talk about. I am going to talk about court-appointed special advocates. I am going to talk about advocacy for children. But I want to do it in this way. I want to talk to you about ch children and child abuse and neglect. Let's talk about what we're dealing with. And I want to talk some about the system that tries to protect these children in the United States and what some of the problems are within that system, and I think then we can talk about the tremendous value that advocacy, in particular volunteer advocacy, brings to these children. And I'm going to end up with a challenge to all of you. So I'm going to hold that for the end and see if you can, all of you, pick up the challenge on behalf of these children. So let's start by talking about what it is we are dealing with in this country 
in terms of maltreatment of children. The size of this problem in this country is truly frightening. A lot of people have described it as an epidemic. There are every year in this country nearly one million children who are identified victims of child abuse or neglect. Now that covers the whole range of abuse and neglect, uh, whether it's sexual abuse, physical abuse, and neglect. Neglect is actually the largest category of maltreatment of children in this country. In the state of Indiana, you have something over 15,000 victims every year. I don't think there is an exact number for the state. And one of the things that happens with a lot of these kids is they cannot live safely at home. Home is not a safe place. And so we remove them. The state steps in and removes them from home and places them in the care of the state, often in foster care, family foster care. In this country, in the most recent year for which we have numbers, there were 547,000 children in foster care. That number is up by more than one-third since 1990. And that's a particularly discouraging fact since we have been trying hard since the early 1990s to try to reduce the number of kids who have to come into foster care in this country. Now listen to this number. We need to talk a little bit about what this costs us. One of the things it costs us is money. The annual cost of maltreating children in the United States is $56 billion. That's billion with a B. And that's a tremendous expense in, uh, throughout this country every year. What is the fastest growing population of kids in foster care who have been maltreated? It is infants, very young children who tend to stay in foster care longer than other children. The average stay in foster care in this country is two years and nine months. Infants tend to stay longer. Now, this, this, there seems to be some good news about Indiana on this, that children, according to the reports from Indiana, children in this state stay in foster care an average of 19 months. That is not a bad record, if that number is believable. By and large, the public in the United States agrees that this is a very serious problem. And why is it so serious? It is really not those numbers which gives you the true sense of how serious this is. There are half a million stories, 547,000 individual stories behind those numbers. Every one of those kids in foster care has a very important story. Let me tell you a couple of the stories that I know of that are very typical. I'm going to give you just a very general outline of some cases in order to protect the confidentiality of the children. Uh, these are not kids who will be identifiable to you at all. But let me give you an example of one of the first cases I dealt with when I was representing children as a guardian ad litem. I represented a nine-year-old boy who had been the victim of sexual abuse by both of his parents. This child, they could not find a foster family for this child, and so they had placed this kid into a group home. Do you know what a group home is? It's a kind of a small group setting for kids. It's a little bit, has a little bit more sense of home than some of a, the larger residential treatment centers that we use. But this kid was going to have to live in a particular room in the group home with a roommate. And they placed with him a roommate who was 15 years old and a sexual offender a child who had committed sexual offenses against other children. And they placed this kid with my client who had already been victimized. And when you are victimized in that way, you are very much subject to further victimization. We had another child who was an infant. I think this, this kid was about eight months old when we first learned about this case. The child had been born in the hospital and the mother had essentially abandoned the child in the hospital. There was no foster family, again, available for this infant. But this infant had no, med no serious medical needs, no medical condition which would require that child to stay in the hospital. And yet, because there was no other placement available for this infant, that child was placed and remained in the hospital for many months 
while they tried to find a home, permanent home for this child. Now, one of the problems of hospital treat, uh, placement is, first of all, it's not anything like a home. And second, it is extremely expensive. It's a very expensive placement for a child, particularly one who doesn't need to be placed there. Another child. This is also a nine-year-old child who was suddenly removed from home because of maltreatment by the parents. Now, I say suddenly because the authorities kind of swept down on this home in the middle of the night, and it, this has got to be frightening to any child, took the child out of the home, and it was a matter of a few minutes that this happened. Now, here we have a frightened child who has already been maltreated by the very people who should have been protecting this child. And what happens immediately with this child? Well, f at, at first, this nine-year-old was placed in a group home. Not a bad placement for this kid. That lasted five days. Then the child was moved. They found a foster family for this child, located 30 miles away. So the child was moved 30 miles away to go to live with this foster family. Within a matter of weeks, the, the worker in this case found out that this child was being mistreated in the foster home, and therefore the child was removed once again and placed in shelter care. In shelter care for about five days while they looked for another foster placement for this child, and they found another foster home, moved the child to the new foster home. But in the course of all this happening, they figured out, and who would be surprised to find out, that this kid had some very special very important needs that could only be met in a specialized foster home. And so they began looking for that foster home for this child and again moved this kid within, this is all within six, six weeks of, of the first placement to a new setting in a specialized foster home. I don't know how many of you have, if, if your families have moved during your lifetimes, I've moved with our kids, we have lived in uh, Pennsylvania, England, uh, Cleveland and the Northwest. That's is that four moves, I think. And they were all traumatic moves for my kids. And yet they have two parents, an intact family, and, and a, both parents with jobs who pay a lot of attention to them. Can you imagine how disruptive it is to a child to be moved this frequently after such a scary event as being removed from home? It is not unusual to see children in this country who are moved repeatedly during their time in foster care from one home to another and never feel as though they have reached a home where they can feel attachment. You know, it's not only the kids, though, that we can tell stories about. Think of what this, this scenario does to a parent. Here's a, a woman, a single mother, who has four kids. These children had been removed from her care and placed into foster homes, all four of them into different foster homes. I, unfortunately, I don't know the geography of your county really well, but let's pretend that that mother lived here and this, these kids were placed in the four corners of the county. This was the type of placement that, this, that happened in this case. Now, the order for this woman to get her children back was that you will visit each of these children once a week and because she had an alcohol problem you will go to substance abuse treatment twice a week and you will attend parenting classes once a week. I didn't add that up. How many different visits is that? Something Maybe eight different required visits a week. This woman had a, a job paying minimum wage. She had no car. Now how in the world was she going to get to, to con cover all these requirements, even if she was absolutely committed to these kids, it was being made so difficult that there was just no way she could meet all those requirements and get these kids back. These are examples of the kinds of issues that we deal with, and this country deals with 547 times a year, 547,000 times a year with kids who are in foster care. Now, not all the stories are are difficult ones or awful ones like that, and not all the stories have lousy outcomes. I'm going to talk to you about good outcomes in a little bit. But think about what are some of the fundamental problems that have brought children and families to this in the first place. The more pressure it, that is placed on a family, 
the more likely it is that you will find mistreatment of children in that family. Now you will hear, and it is true, that abuse and neglect of children can occur across the spectrum of families. One parent families, two parent families, Caucasian families, families of color, poor families, wealthy families. That is absolutely true. However, it is also true that poverty creates such stresses on families that there is a relationship between low income and abuse and neglect of children. Think about it. Poverty, what does it mean? Maybe you have a housing problem. Maybe you can't afford housing. Maybe you don't have a car. Maybe you can't buy the services that you know your children need. Maybe, in fact, there is substance abuse going on and you wanted to do something about it, but you couldn't get access to the helping services you need to get out from under it. Is it any surprise that families dealing with all of these problems may not have done what we would like them to do in terms of caring for their families? You should understand that when we think about neglectful families in this country, it is not necessarily evil people who are doing this intentionally to their children. And in fact, it may be people who simply lack housing and children are therefore placed in care. It may be people who do not have the understanding or resources to deal with mental health issues. Imagine a child in one of those families who has obsessive compulsive disorder, who has severe depression, all of it undiagnosed and untreated. These are very difficult things for parents to deal with. These are very difficult things for, people, for parents to deal with if they have all of the assets to buy resources for a child. They're much more difficult to deal with if you don't have those assets. And so, in fact, in the United States, there are children who are placed into care because of poverty. There are also poor families who voluntarily place their children in care because they believe it's the only way they can get help for their children. And that is also a frightening prospect for us if that is in fact the only way that that can happen for those children. You should also remember that the myth that poor families typically abuse their children is a myth. That is not true. Most poor parents do take care of their children and do not maltreat them. Now what happens? What happens to this large group of kids? Where are they going to go? Where are they going to end up? What are all the consequences associated with both being maltreated by your parents and being placed into care? Of those 547,000 children, 110,000 are currently waiting to be adopted. Adopted is a potential solution for a lot of those kids. And adoption, as those of us who are adoptive parents know, can work with children that years ago we thought were not adoptable, children with special needs, older children. Uh, there are success stories about these kids, but listen to the number, 110,000 waiting children. In the most recent year, we managed to get 36,000 children adopted out of the foster care system. And the national goal for the year 2002 is to have 54,000 children adopted out of foster care. What does that mean? You can do the subtraction as well as I can. There are tens of thousands of children waiting for adoption who have no likely prospect of finding it before they will reach age 18 and leave the foster care system with the expectation that somehow these children who have been left behind maltreated by the people who should have been taken care of that could take care of them, that somehow these people will then be able to, at age 18, take care of themselves. Find a job, find a place to live, understand how to handle their money, and be productive and happy adults. Is it any surprise that that doesn't typically happen? We have 72,000 young people in foster care who are waiting, awaiting what we call emancipation at age 18, who are typically not well prepared to be emancipated from that system. Here's another consequence. You've probably heard some of the research about the relationship between criminal activity and abuse and neglect or an experience in foster care. Now this one is something that, that is much more complicated than what you will usually hear reported in the press. But think about this. 
Child Welfare League recently reported a study that said nine to 12 year old children who are abused are more likely to be arrested. But that's not the startling fact. They were 67 times more likely to be arrested than children who were not abused. That is a, that's a truly startling number. There are also studies which say they look at prison populations and they ask the, the folks in prison, what's your, what's, they try to find out the background of these folks. And they find that the majority of people in our adult criminal prisons had experienced foster care at some time in their lives. It is, there is also an est estimate from the National Institute of Justice that child abuse and domestic violence account for about one-third of the costs, crime costs every year in this country. Now, the, none of this means that abuse or neglect or foster care causes criminal behavior. There's nothing that shows that. There's certainly a relationship between these two. And it is also true that most kids that we work with are not going to end up as criminals. I think this is an important thing for us to keep in mind. As we understand this research, let's also remember that it is not inevitable that these kids are going to end up there. It is very likely that these kids are going to end up sitting in audiences like this, standing up in front of audiences like this, running organizations, running corporations. That's what we want for them. So that research does not mean that that is not possible. Other consequences, think about domestic violence. I hope some of you have learned, maybe in your classes or elsewhere, about domestic violence. There is a very important relationship, and again, a complicated one, between domestic violence, domestic violence between spouses, and the abuse of children. Listen to this one. Women who suffer abuse by their spouses are two times as likely to abuse or neglect their children. That sounds pretty clear, doesn't it? It's not that clear. In fact, in many states in the United States, neglect can be defined as a failure to protect the child from an abusing or neglectful parent. So if a woman has been subject to domestic violence by her spouse, and does not prevent that spouse from abusing or neglecting the children in many jurisdictions, she can be charged with neglect and those children can be removed. Now wouldn't it be much smarter for us to think of and understand and be compassionate about that person as a victim of violence with whom we would work instead of a perpetrator of violence who we, whom we would punish? So think about that, that research. Now here's a, here's a piece of research that I do believe, and we see this in kids all the time. This has to do with witnessing violence. I don't want to get into movies and all that stuff, but I do know the research that talks about children witnessing domestic violence, a father abusing the child's mother. Those children are at a very high risk of emotional and behavioral problems, very significant problems. So again, think about what lands a child in foster care, a woman who is being subjected to abuse, a child who witnesses it and therefore has behavior problems. It is much more difficult in that setting for a woman to be able to handle the child who has those behavior problems. How about this one? Children having children. Two thirds of teenage mothers in one study, poor teenage mothers, were sexual abuse victims themselves and generally had been sexually abused before the age of 10. Again, is that cause and effect? We don't know, but the belief is if we could only have prevented the abuse in the first place, then perhaps that mother would not have gone on to have a, a child while she was also a teenager. Substance abuse. In our cases, we work with about 207,000 children every year. In our cases, about 80% of those cases, substance abuse is a significant issue. 
And in the United States, generally, in abuse and neglect cases, it's believed to be anywhere from two-thirds of the cases to something like 85 to 90 percent of the cases. Substance abuse has become a tremendously significant problem. Listen, listen to this, though. In those 547,000 children in foster care, almost half, not quite half, but almost, almost half are African-American children. They are so significantly overrepresented in foster care, not in proportion to the occurrence of abuse or neglect in the population. So what's going on? Some people believe that part of the reason is substance abuse, because they believe there is more substance abuse in those communities. There are, therefore, more children being neglected, and therefore, more children being placed into foster care. However, a study showed that if you gave in, in some jurisdictions, if you gave the same set of facts to a set of decision makers, people who decide whether a child has been abused or neglected, and you only change one fact, and that's the color of the child, you will get a different result. When you change the color of the child to an African American child, you will find more decisions to remove the child from home and place that child into foster care. There are factors in this system that are affecting this overrepresentation of children that we need to pay attention to. And there, some others, other factors are the services that we provide or don't provide to children and families in need. So I'd like to talk for a minute about what I think of as systemic issues. We have in this country set up in every jurisdiction, every state in the country, a system of child protection that steps in when a child has been abused or neglected and has the job of making sure that that child is safe and finds a safe permanent home. When the state steps in this way, you may have read some of this, this material about this, it works in as if the state were a parent. The parent has some of the same responsibilities to that child as the original parents had to the child, which only makes sense because the child is in the care of the state. But I'll tell you this, and I believe all of us who work in this field are convinced of it, including those who work within the child protection system. If the state does that, it had better be prepared to do a good job of it. So let's look at what kind of a job this system is able to do for kids as a parent. For every dollar we spend to keep a child in foster care, we spend 12 cents to provide that child with helping services, counseling, all of those things that we want to help a child. Now that puts in some perspective the commitment we have to really helping these children get back to where they need to be. Listen to this one, 45% of the money we spend every year in child welfare services is spent on 20% of the children. Anybody have an idea of who those 20% of the kids are? It's kids in residential treatment centers. Now I had the pleasure last night of seeing a, a beautiful center here, the Youth Opportunities Center, which is probably the only one I've ever visited that I could come out saying, man, that is a wonderful place doing a really incredible job. If you haven't, if you have not had a chance to see that place, I would really recommend if you can arrange a tour or at least get the material and read about it, it is extremely impressive and unfortunately unique in this country. We are spending 45% of our money every year on services in many jurisdictions that have no evidence that they are any better than placement into ordinary foster care. The research on many of these, these institutions is frankly lousy, and yet the money continues to be spent on them. Go out and take a look at what's possible, and then advocate for getting that to other kids. Now let's talk about services in children of color. It is not true that African American tr children in the foster care system do not receive uh, the same level of services as Caucasian children. Those levels are actually very similar. However, 
It is true that Asian and Hispanic children in foster care are much less likely than white and African American children to receive services. Now this is a very disturbing trend to particularly to advocates for Asian children because Asian children in this country are subjected to all kinds of stereotypes which say things like they have strong families, they you know all these belief systems about Asian kids and so on. And yet we are not providing the services that we need to to these kids. We kind of funnel we funnel things down in this system. Every year we have, this is three million, three million reports of abuse and neglect. Half of those are investigated. About uh, a third of those investigations are substantiated. About half of those substantiated cases are provided with services. And do you know how many of those kids go to court or go to foster care? 19% get a court hearing and 16% are placed into foster care. So this funneling down is a process that needs attention because one of the things we have heard around this country is that children, particularly in their adolescent years, who 10 years ago would have been provided with protection and helping services are now being left on their own under the theory that a 14-year-old is much more capable of protecting himself from a blow than is a five-year-old. Now maybe that's true, but does it justify inaction on their behalf? Another uh, trend in this country in terms of services has been managed care. I have a managed care health plan at the National CASA office. Uh, we all have an, an HMO that we're a part of and uh, I don't think it's the best kind of care we could get, but it's affordable. But managed care in this country is more and more becoming the way we provide services, particularly health services, also mental health services, to children in foster care. And a number of these managed care organizations are run for profit. And I believe there are significant issues of not just fraud, but poor management within these organizations that to me raise serious questions about whether we ought to be allowing managed care organizations to ration services to our children in need, and in particular, whether we ought to be allowing people to make a profit off of children who have been abused and neglected. Now that also is not, a, it sounds like it's a simple answer, it is not necessarily a simple one, but it is also an issue that doesn't get enough attention amongst decision makers and I believe that children are damaged because of it. Listen to this one. I talked with some folks last, some of the folks from the, our local program last night about this one. In this country we have, well, probably all of you know how to use computers, don't you? You use databases and word processing, all that stuff, and I do too. And I can carry around with me that little computer that anytime I want I can get online and find out my email and all that stuff. Do you know that in this country, the Centers for Disease Control can tell us exactly how many kids were killed by running into soccer goalposts, but they cannot tell us how many children were, were killed by their parents or caretakers every year? Do you know that there are people who call up and say, I am ready to adopt a child out of foster care. I'm ready to take siblings. I'm ready to take older kids, special needs kids. I'm ready. You know, let me do it. And it's unbelievable to me how often the answer is 110,000 waiting children, don't forget. The answer is we can't find any children for you to adopt. How could that be? Well, part of the answer is that we have too often lousy data collection systems related to these children. We lose children. We lose track of where they are. We can't remember who visited them, how often they visited, what kinds of services they got, or who's paying for it, or where their parents are, or how often their parents have been to visit. Some, in a lot of places, we're still keeping big written, handwritten notes about all this stuff, and you can't read some of those notes. In this country, I can ship you a shipment of Washington State apples, and I call up FedEx any time, day or night, and I will find out the hour, minute, and second 
that it was delivered to the ramp in Seattle, what airplane it had, what time the airplane landed, what truck picked it up off the dock, what time it picked it up, what, who's the driver of that truck, and what time it's going to arrive at your home. But we can't find 110,000 waiting children for whom there are parents out there. This is something that we have got to change in this country. It's, uh, to me, this is ridiculous. Another systemic issue is that we tend, the things that we do count too often tend to be things that just don't matter very much. Now, I happen to care about how often someone visits a child in foster care. I think that's worth counting. But the only reason it's worth counting is I want to know that somebody's paying attention and somebody's doing a good job for that kid and that, in fact, that child ends up with what we want, which is a safe, permanent home. That's what I want to count. How many children in foster care actually arrived at a safe, permanent home by the end of this year? I'd like to know that for those 547,000 kids. Now, you will hear that a certain number of those kids return home. They are reunified with their parents. But do you know, we don't know how many of those kids are reabused and sent back into foster care later. Oh, we have some studies that look six months down the road. Well, what happens next year? We need to know what happens to those kids. The mental health needs of children in foster care are very significant. And yet, around this country, we have children who are being told, go, we'll provide you with a counselor. Have you ever tried to get somebody to go to a mental health counselor? <laughs> it's, it's not easy. You may take years trying to convince somebody to do it, and then when they finally go, it's got to be the right person. And yet we have organizations saying, you can go four times. Four times to deal with these very significant issues that have been ingrained in you year after year through all this maltreatment. We do a lousy job on meeting children's mental health needs in this country, and we can certainly do better than that. We also need to think about what kinds of outcomes are good outcomes for these children. I said safe, permanent homes for these children. That's what we want. Ideally, that's what we would get through adoption or a safe return home. But there are some other options for children. I don't know if some of you may have known children, young people, teenagers in foster care. And for some of those kids, it may be appropriate to remain with their current foster family as the expected permanent location for them. And maybe that's all right. Maybe we ought to find mechanisms in this country to increase the support and the permanency of those long-term foster care arrangements and count them as victories. If the child is comfortable and happy and is supported and loved in that family, maybe that's fine, even if it's not a formal adoption. And yet, too often, our laws say that's not good enough. You need to move that kid somewhere else. We have about a third of our children in foster care in this country being cared for by kin, relatives of the child, a lot of times grandparents. This is an issue that also needs attention because in many states in this country, those kin are pressured to take care of these children even though they may not want to and may not be really equipped to handle those kids. In California, half of the kids in foster care are in kinship care. Forty states apply less stringent standards to kinship care than they do to foster care. And they may provide, though not all of them, in, this is not true everywhere, but they may provide much lower levels of support for those kinship care providers, including lower rates of reimbursement for expenses, which to me, again, is, is a poor decision on behalf of a child. We have in this country people who are trying to make these systems work on behalf of children. There's this tension, and if you took two rubber bands and you could tie a, like a stone in the middle of it, and you stretch the rubber bands, that stone would, could represent where we are on a continuum. On this end, is what I would call family autonomy. The, the, the belief that you should leave families alone, that children's care is up to, to parents and that's a private area and the state shouldn't get involved. On this side is child protection, the belief that we should step in and aggressively protect parent, uh, children from their parents, even if we sometimes make mistakes and get overly aggressive about it. And in this country, we've moved this center back and forth over the years. Since 1980, this thing kept kind of moving over this way towards what 
we called family preservation. And so we kept trying to send kids home. Send kids home on trial, see if they'll be safe. Oh, some of the kids aren't safe when they go home, but you know, we were gonna try it and find out. So a kid got beat up again because we were trying it out. Well, you know, kind of that's what happens. Now that this has moved back the other direction some, we've moved more towards child protection. There's this constant balancing of these two tensions within this system. And a lot of times, this is driven by law. Now, I'm a lawyer, and I have represented children. I've taught in law school. I've argued about legislation with folks in Washington. Uh, I'd have to say that I don't have a great belief in law as the solution to these systemic issues that I'm talking about. That is not law alone. We got a lot of law. You know, if we put together all the law relating to children, you'd, we'd be reading for a long time. It's worth reading, and it's worth passing good laws. But good laws only make a difference if we implement them in a way that makes them appropriate for each child. There's no law that you can pass that says what Johnny needs tomorrow. But there are laws that have been passed, and there are change efforts going on in the United States, reform efforts, that generate amongst our advocates lots of excitement. One of them is the Adoption and Safe Families Act, which is accelerating, attempting to accelerate the movement of children out of foster care and into safe permanent homes through a whole bunch of mechanisms. And it remains to be seen whether that really makes a difference for children. But there is also a lot of interest by judges and courts around the country in trying some new approaches. There's one that came to us from New Zealand. This is really fun. It's called Family Group Conferencing. Under this approach, when a child is brought into the system, usually what we do, you know, you get all the professionals together and they figure out what ought to happen, they come up with a plan and they apply it to the family. Under this approach, you p find all the family members you can and other people, in fact, who, who, who know this child very well and you put them in a room and you tell them to come up with the plan. And what they found in New Zealand was that this created a lot more commitment to this child. It created a lot more creativity in the plans for the kids. And I believe it helped get more kids, sim uh, kids home. How many of you have heard this? It takes a whole village to raise a child. You, most people have heard it, haven't you? Um, it's used by uh, some folks in, in the child advocacy field that I respect a lot that I enjoy a lot and I think are, are very smart people. And it would be great if we had whole villages that could help us to raise children. However, I'm also convinced that it can be a single individual who makes the key difference for a child. And this is, to me, tremendously exciting because all of those laws that they pass in Washington or anywhere else that they pass laws, it's individual action on behalf of children which can make them really effective for the kids. What if I told you this? What if I told you that every one of you sitting here, I'm not sure how many there are, but let's say there are maybe, what, 40 people here. What if I told you that every one of you could make all the difference to an abused or neglected child? And that is the truth. In fact, Every one of you can do something to, to, to uh, make the life better for an abused or neglected child. It will change, you can change a person's life. And this is the most phenomenal part of it. I'm sure some of our volunteers who are here would, would acknowledge this. It will change your life just as dramatically. That is one of the most exciting things about it. So I do want to talk about what we do as court-appointed special advocates because I, I want it to lead into the challenge that I want to give to you, and I am going to try to remember to leave some time for questions at the end. Maybe we can just talk for a bit. CASA, Court Appointed Special Advocates, began in 1977 in the city of Seattle by a judge who, who kept worrying at night that he didn't have enough information to make decisions about a child's life. The idea, though, goes back into history as far as Roman law if you look back into Roman times, there were courts at that time who had responsibility for protecting children. 
And there was an idea that that court should hand that responsibility to some individual who can watch over the child, who can be a guardian for the child. In the Middle Ages in England, this became, the language started to become used was guardian ad litem. That is, a guardian for the purposes of this litigation affecting the child. In 60% of our programs, our volunteers serve as guardians ad litem. But all over our programs, all 900 of them, our folks do a job which is very similar to what the original idea was in Roman law. Appointed by a court, that gives you the power to see everything you need to see. The power and the authority of the court stands behind you in this work. And the court is saying, our responsibility to protect children must be exercised by a very special individual. It cannot be the judge, because the judge needs to remain the impartial decision maker in the case. It needs to be someone appointed as an officer of the court to carry out this protection responsibility. What a tremendously powerful thing that is. In our case, it is volunteers who do this work, which is also very powerful. Why? What if I'm being paid to do this work? And in fact, when I first got out of law school and was given my first case to work with a kid, 14-year-old in foster care, I was paid to go represent that child as that child's guardian ad litem attorney. I was paid 13 cents an hour. Now, you weren't going to make a living out of doing that unless, unless all you did was meet the child five minutes before court, the court hearing, in which case you were not doing the job, but you were at least going through the motions of it. I've talked to lawyers who do this work for pay, and one of them had 700 cases on her caseload. If you have 700 kids in your caseload, you are not representing that child. Volunteers who are not beholden to a particular professional uh, area like the law or social work or any of these things, we've got professionals in those areas to do that job. Volunteers who are simply beholden to that child and whose livelihood does not depend on whether they please anyone else showing up in this case. Advocates. We are advocates for children. We speak powerfully on their behalf. Not only do we tell the judge what the child wants, we tell the judge what the child needs, what's going on in this child's life, what's happening all around this child. And so court-appointed special advocates all aim to provide the court the information it needs to get a child to a safe permanent home as quickly as possible. Again, based on this, this wonderful history, this, this organization, this network grows by about 13% a year. 207,000 children in 1999, 53,000 volunteers in over 900 communities. It is a tremendously powerful voice for children. And we know that the effects of advocating for children in this way are also truly dramatic. If we could bring up kids who had been through this with a volunteer, you would he hear things like, you changed my life forever. You were the only person who was there for me throughout the process. I felt like somebody believed in justice for me. Now, isn't that a powerful thing for a kid to learn at a time where things look to be really awful? We had a case recently, a volunteer who was working with uh, three kids, siblings, and she found out there were seven more siblings in other placements. And she went about and got these other seven kids together, and they decided they, these kids were free for adoption, that they should all ten be adopted together. And she convinced the foster parents, who were a retired couple, who had no intention of starting up a family, much less a family of ten kids, convinced them to adopt all ten of those kids together. If you ever get a chance, we have a new video coming out that shows one of these kids, uh, I think he's 11 years old, Juan is his name, and he will tell you, you will not be able to sit through this and not have tears come to your eyes. That's the kind of impact that this kind of advocacy can have on children. Let me tell you some of the things that we need to do, all of us together as advocates. Whether you can come in now and be a court-appointed special advocate volunteer, or whether as you're thinking about careers and where you're going to go, 
whether you might think about this down the road, you can still become an advocate for the, the needs of these children right now. One is, everywhere I go in this country, I walk into courtrooms, courthouses, that are awful places for children to be. I was in one where the waiting room was probably the size of this portion of the stage, and I walked in and there was a five-year-old child sitting on a bench and a man and a woman on either side, I think the mother and the father, arguing why no, neither one of them wanted this child right over this kid's head. And then who walks in? The lawyer for the mother and the lawyer for the father. And they start negotiating a settlement to that dispute right over this kid's head. That should never happen. And yet in courts around this country, some of these cases are being tried in courthouses that are also trying adult criminal cases. They're waiting in some of the same waiting rooms. We can't mistreat tr children that way in this system. Again, go out and look at this center right here in Muncie, where it is, it is built to be appropriate for children. We need to make sure that facilities for these children are appropriate for them. There is no court in this country that makes a more important decision than what happens to a child's life. Why is it any more important whether Microsoft is going to be broken up or not than it is where is a child going to live? I'd pay more money to get that decision made well than to get the Microsoft decision made well but we don't put the money we need to into these courts. Now, you can help with this. There is a piece of federal legislation that is currently before Congress called the Strengthening Abuse and Neglect Courts Act, what we call SANCA for short. It would provide money to these courts to be more appropriate for children. It would provide training to court personnel to be better able to serve the children. It would provide the ki some, at least, of the kinds of facilities that we want to see for children in other locations around this country. So take a look at it, and I can't urge what you might want to do with that particular piece of legislation, but you can see how important I think it is. I've, I would encourage you to take a look, read it through, and see whether you might do something with that. I think we need to, f we need to put an end to this terrible issue of poor data about children. In this country, it is time for us to stop being afraid in the child protection system, to stop being afraid of good data and get on with it. Now, this is a great place for people in universities to be helpful. We've got folks in, in universities here and across the country who understand how to make computers work, how to make them work well for children, and we need to pull that kind of expertise in to make these data systems better and then for us to do better evaluations of what we're all doing so we look at the data we've collected and try to figure out what it means and we put together the kind of professional training that people who work with these kids have got to have. Now isn't that a pretty good mission for folks in a university to have? So I would, I don't know where at Ball State is the right place, but I would encourage every one of you to, to run out after it stops raining and find out where these things could happen and maybe they already are to some extent in Ball State. I'll give you an example of this training issue. I, I, I'm, this is going to bother the camera, but I'm, I'm going to walk away from the microphone to show you this. I'm a lawyer and I've just been trying to represent you since you were 14 years old and you've been in foster care for five years. So what if I used to move a football team dressed like this in a suit and I say to you, I'm your lawyer. Tell me what's going on and I'm going to be your lawyer. So what, what do you think that is? That's a suit, right? It's a person kind of suit. And I don't even know what it means to have a lawyer. So what is it you're going to do for me? So we come in to see people. We just try to talk to a child, a young person. We say, first of all, you take this off. And then you sit down on the chair and you're on the same level with the person. You turn the chair around. And, and I have this thing about, particularly with young children, that they really respond to the, what I often am, which is the stupid adult. You know, you go in and you say something just really stupid. And you know, a kid who is hesitant to talk, when they see an adult who makes a mistake, you know, they'll laugh about it and, and, and it, it, it can start to get them talking. This is just a kind of general idea of the kinds of things that are involved in learning how to do this kind of work. And when I was in law school, there was no training on this. There was not one single class on child abuse and neglect. There certainly was no class on child development or how to talk to kids. You know, we were taught how to talk in court, but not how to talk to kids. 
So we can all make a difference in that. Here's another one. I think we all need to advocate, and those of you who are in the criminal justice classes, this is a, this is a great one. First of all, I think we should separate the investigation of the crime of child abuse from the service of child protection. When we confuse these things, it's too difficult to accomplish that important role of protecting children. Second, I believe that child abusers, serious child abusers who have committed a crime, need to be prosecuted for it. Why is it, why would it be a crime for someone to beat up an adult, but not be a crime for somebody to beat up a child? I don't see any sense in that. Why would it be a, a crime worth life in prison for someone to kill an adult and not a crime that needs to be taken care of to kill a child? Next, and this is part of the challenge uh, that I bring to you, all these things I think are challenges, but I believe that we should all make a promise that we will no longer have child abuse in the United States. This is a completely preventable event. Completely preventable. It doesn't have to happen. It's not like catching a virus that you cannot avoid. And I think every one of us, as we, those of you who are not yet parents, I think we all need to learn how to parent children. I think we all need to advocate for parenting education in the public schools, good, solid parenting education so we understand how to take care of kids when we have them. And I think we need to do this, which is to speak positively about children, even children who have been abused and neglected, as potential success stories. There is no child that we work with, there's no child in foster care who cannot become a success, who cannot become a happy, productive adult. And all of us need to aim for that in our work. And those of you who are students and thinking about the work that you're going to go into, this doesn't need to be your life's work that you get paid for. But if you can remember, when you're out in your career making a living, it's worth the time to spend some extra hours doing something like this on behalf of children who may be less fortunate than most of us, but who are waiting for you to come in and be that powerful voice in that child's, that child's life. Before we, how am I doing on time? We're gonna need to get to some questions. Okay, let me just, before we do the questions, just, just give you a couple of, there are a couple of resources I wanted to tell you about. One is certainly our website. I'd invite you to take a look at that if you're interested in more of these issues and more information about that. And that is www.casanet.org. www.casanet.org. It has a library there. It has descriptions of what we do. If you're interested in involvement here, Pat is with us. I'm sure she'd be happy to talk to anyone afterwards. There are also some written materials that I, if you're interested in this area of work or in these issues, I would encourage you to take a look at a couple of things, particularly a, a book by Richard Gellis called The Book of David. This was written a couple of years ago. It deals a lot with family preservation issues and some of the political issues that surround it. Uh, it's a very well-written book. Uh, I think very well thought of and presents a pretty balanced view of that area. There's a wonderful report, it's quite a thick report, done in the early 90s by the National Commission on Children, and it's called Beyond Rhetoric. Now, I'm not sure if it's still in print or not, but it, it may be available in the library. It is a tremendous compilation of both information and uh, programs about children, it covers the whole spectrum of children's issues. So if you're interested in becoming an advocate for children, whether it's in the child abuse and neglect field or not, find that somewhere. National Commission of Children Beyond Rhetoric. It's tremendous. For uh, children in foster care, there's a kind of a classic that is worth reading. Uh, it's, uh, I believe it was written in the 50s by Moss and Engler. It's called Children in Need of Parents. It will, uh, if your eyes haven't been opened, uh, it will certainly help you to understand some of the other ramifications of children who are not able to get the kind of help they need. A book written by one of our volunteers 
who describes her experience in advocating for abused and neglected children. It's Gay Corder. Gay Corder is a novelist. You may, may know her in that, that area. She's been fairly successful, but she wrote a book uh, two or three years ago called I Speak for This Child. And if you can get hold of that, it's a, it's a very inspirational book and explains, I think, very well how you can forcefully advocate on behalf of, a, of abused and neglected children. Uh, beyond those, there are, uh, there are books by Doug Besharov, uh, all of them very well done. Jane Nitzer, who is an advocate for children, has been for a number of years. Also, any, any of their uh, pieces are also very informative and very, I think, very well done. Let's do, some, let's do some questions if you have some, or if you have some comments, too. Let's uh, take some time to do that. And if you need to leave, I don't hear the rain any longer, but you're, you're certainly welcome if you need to. What questions do you have? 